And I'm asking myself this question when I was reading the scripture. I said, Jesus, Lord, what type of servant am I? And some of you guys are saying, well, listen, didn't God just bless her with resources, put the blessing on her lap by pouring oil into all these jars? Yes, but God ain't just gonna send you money. You got to go out and sell it. How many decisions have you made in the last five, 10 decisions you've made have been related to money? If I serve an unlimited God, if I serve a God with unlimited resources, I would serve a God with unlimited provisions, why am I limiting myself? As I look back on my life, I look at many different things that happened, and guess what? For a large part of my life, I was not listening. I was doing this, I was doing this, I was doing this. I spent my 30s repaying back the mistakes of my 20s because I wasn't listening. I never looked at the Bible as an instruction manual to seek stories and examples of success. And one of the examples of success was in Matthew 25 in the New Testament. Uh, 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 Matthew 25 starts at verse 14. It's called the parable of the talents. So the parable of the talents goes like this. And I'll paraphrase here uh, throughout this video. But it begins with a master. He had lined up his servants. He's about to go on a long journey. And so he lines up his servants and says, listen, I'm about to go on a journey, but I want to see what you do with money. I want to give you talent, which is money. Talents is money. It's an equivalent factor. And he said, I'm going to give you money, talents, according to your ability. So line it up. One, two, three. One, he gave five talents. The other one, he gave two talents. And the other one, he gave one talent according, according to scripture, according to his ability. Underlined to his ability. I'll reference that here in a second. And then he left. And immediately, as soon as the master left, the one who got five talents, he went to work. Boom, five, he turned into another five. The same thing happened when they got two. So he's got two talents, boom, he immediately went to work, turned, to, turned into two. The one that got one talent, again, according to the ability, he got one talent, and what did he do? He didn't turn one into another one. He turned one, and he was fearful, and he buried it in the ground. He buried it. Why? Operated out of fear. Make a long story short, the master returns. He says, what'd you do with my money? What'd you do with my talents? He says, master, I took the five talents and immediately made another five talents. So I'm giving you a total of 10 talents back. Wow. Master says, my good and faithful servant, what you've done with the least, you'll be blessed with the most. To one, he gave two talents, again, according to his ability. He says, what'd you do with my money? What'd you do with my talents? He says, listen, I took your two and I made it to two as well. So here's a total of four talents back at you. Again, he says, wow, my good and faithful servant which you've been trusted with the least, you'll be blessed with the most. And now, the drama starts to increase. It goes, hey, you, the one I gave one. But basically, I gave you one talent, according to his ability. Would you do my money? Would you do my talents? He says, master, I know what type of guy you are. Again, I'm paraphrasing. He goes, I know what type of guy you are. You just make money out of nowhere. You create things, you make things happen. I, nobody knows how you do, but you just make things happen. I know the type of guy you are. And listen, man, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of the way you do things. And I just don't want to lose what you gave me. So instead of making one to one like the other two did, and I should have watched them, guess what he says? He says, he says in verse 25, I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. He says, see, here's what belongs to you. So he just returned him his one talent. Master replies, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, at least it would have gained some interest. That's what he's saying. That's he said, listen, you should have put my money to work somehow, some way, even if you didn't want to do it, at least the bankers would have done something with it. They would have gotten some interest when I came back. And so what he did is he took that talent, he took the one talent he gave that servant, he gave it to the one who made the most with it. And he says this in this verse, check this out. He says in verse 29, for everyone who has will be given more and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. And here's the last part about this. He says, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness when they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. What an end to that parable. What an end to that story. So here's how I internalize it. By the way, these are the red words. These are the words, depending on what type of Bible you're reading. These are stories that Jesus talked about and shared. And when I'm reading this, here's how, here's how I take it. Here's how I take, and by the way, I love your opinion on it. But here's my five things that I took from it. When, when I read this for the very first time, I unpacked it and I analyzed every verse, every sentence and how it applied to my life. Here's, here, here's where I was at a particular point in my life. I was divorced. I was a single father with three kids. 
I was so broke. I had like a four or 500 credit score. I had less than 200, 300 bucks in a bank at most. I had all my credit cards maxed. I was bad. I had three different jobs. I was a Jiffy Lou hood technician. I was a Olive Garden server. I was a YMC lifeguard. And then I was just starting my business in the insurance industry. And then this Bible verse, this Bible parable comes across my way. It's amazing how God works. And I'm reading this. I took five things from it. And these are some of the things that, and by the way, let me share with you something I kept in my Bible from my broke moments. I actually kept an ATM receipt. I keep this ATM receipt. And maybe we'll show this, but uh, we'll show a visual of this. But I kept this ATM receipt because I remember there's a moment in my life where I was so broke. I was so broke. And I was like, man, let me just feed my kids. And I go to the ATM machine at, uh, at Dominic's when Dominic's was still around. And there's an ATM machine there with the ATM receipt still sticking out of it. And I was just curious how much money somebody before me took out of the ATM. So here I am. I'm just struggling to take $20. So I, took, I take this ATM receipt, whoosh, I pull it, boom, 500 bucks. Somebody before me took out $500, the daily maximum limit. And then on top of that, not only did they take out $500, but they left $114,000 still in the checking account. And this is at a moment in time where I was absolutely broke. So a couple things, man, I was going through at that moment. I was reading this Bible. And next thing you know, this ATM receipt, I said, Lee's Lord, you have a funny sense of humor. And uh, I started understanding what the good Lord was saying to me through scripture. Number one, don't operate out of fear. He says, listen, because you operated out of fear, he got cast out. Because he operated out of fear, he didn't learn from his buddies. One took two towns, made two towns. The other one made five from his original five towns. He wasn't asking questions. He was operating out of fear. He kept his lens closed, his mind closed, his heart closed, everything was closed. He said, listen, man, I don't want to get in trouble, man. I'm just going to bury it in the ground. And when I'm looking at this guy, he got fired. He's not even a servant. And there's some people watching this video say, listen, I'm good, I'm good, but I operate out of fear. Listen, you may be on the radar, but you're not a servant. If you believe in the word, if you believe in the good book says about what you can do out of your life and you operate out of fear, well, guess what? You're not even a servant, in my opinion. I might be wrong. But when you're, when you're operating out of faith, you say, okay, I trust you. When you operate out of fear, you say, I don't trust you. Consider that. The second thing here, okay, because he didn't understand how to make more money, how to take this talents to grow, not only did he operate out of fear, but he didn't even earn interest. He, at least he could have put it in the bank. In other words, they weren't even saving money. They weren't investing money. They weren't allowing the seed, which is what money really is. Money is just a seed. It's capital. So, so you can allow it to grow. It's for me, I took money. It was capital into my business. I took 500 bucks. So in this video, I share with you how we took my seed of $500 and over my total of my career, we created a $45 million business out of it. Because I decided not to operate in fear. I decided to operate in faith. And I have my money to earn and grow. And he said, listen, even if you were fearful, the easiest way for you to gain some confidence, and for me as the master to start being happy, if you feel that in your heart of hearts, that your money is merely a tool, that your money is merely currency, that you're just a steward of what the good Lord gives you, that you should be earning interest on your money. There should not be a scenario where we should be living paycheck to paycheck. We should not be uh, uh, living broke to book. We should not be experiencing this wealth gap. But what, why are we? A lot of you say, well, Matt, it's the external factors, Matt. It's the external factors, Matt. Oh, dude, I totally get it. I was experiencing those same external factors too as well. But I didn't operate out of fear. I wasn't waiting for nobody to tell me to do something. I definitely wasn't waiting for my money not to earn any money. I was finding ways to make my money grow. And my encouragement to you, if you're watching this, my encouragement to you during this holiday season, please, if you want to have 2021 be the most financially prosperous year for you, you got to tuck money away, not operate in fear, and have your money earning interest. Allow it to grow, allow it to manifest. That it could be a seed that, cre that creates a new harvest in your life. Number three, whew, this is a big one. If you don't know how to make that seed become a harvest in your life, keep in mind, he gave, the master gave talents according to their ability. And I'm asking myself this question when I was reading the scripture. I said, Jesus, Lord, what type of servant am I? Am I the one talent servant? Am I the two talent servant? Or am I the five talent servant? Because he gave them money according to their ability. And so check this out, guys. This is what the master said. Hmm, I'm not sure if I trust you, but here's one. Let me see what you do with it. Okay, let me give you one, one talent, one, give one opportunity. Give me, you give, I'll give you one dollar, hundred, whatever, whatever that scale is. 
The other one, he says, mm, I think I'll trust you a little bit more. Here's two talents. And the other servant says, dude, <clears throat> I know what you're doing. Here's five talents. I gave you the most. So think about this real quick. You have a relationship with the Lord, right? And the Lord gives you an opportunity. One opportunity. What do you do with it? You operate out of fear? Or does it place an abundance of opportunities your way? Does it place an abundance of clients and people and opportunities and doors opening for you because he knows that you know what to do with it. What is your ability? Have you assessed your ability? Have you assessed what to do with a thousand dollars, with five hundred dollars, with fifty thousand dollars? Because if you've been trusted with the least, then you will be blessed with the most. So do you know what to do with the least? According to your ability. Whoa, this is preaching now, isn't it? That's what the scriptures telling me. Number four, back to that point. Are you doing the most with the least? What exactly are you doing with the least? Are you living paycheck to paycheck? Are you spending more than what you have? Are you cutting away, slicing away some money to give, to tithe, to save? Are you, are you saying, okay, man, I, I got $1,000, but I'm going to spend $1,500 thanks to credit cards? And hopefully next month I just pay off the interest of my monthly payments instead of actually paying off the whole credit card? Am I, am I, am I doing the most with what I have, with what I've been given? And if so, guess what? The master might come back from his journey and say, oh, you're a two-talent servant. Let me now give you five talents because you've done with the least. Now you're going to be blessed with the most. Guys, I don't have a college degree. I don't have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. All I got is experience. And all I've done is just follow biblical principles in the Bible that's helped me see money in my actions and my business differently. And here's the crazy part. I go to church on Sundays. Listen, I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I'm not here to judge anybody. But here's my observation. I go to church on Sundays. And people put their arms out. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. And the moment they get in a parking lot, they forget what they're asked to be blessed with. They forget the testimony. They forget what they were asking for in church. They start operating back in fear again. Come Monday morning, they operate in fear again. But the Lord can't bless you because with the least he's given you, you're not doing anything about it. Whew. And maybe that's a talk and a conversation some of you don't want to hear, but perhaps need to hear. And maybe this is the video just to share and expose that to you. But if you want to be blessed with the most, you got to make sure you do with the least as much as, po as much you possibly can with what you know. And if you're always asking questions, if you find yourself in a position of always asking questions like, OK, OK, why is this opportunity being put in front of me again? Why is somebody talking to me about saving and budgeting again? Why is somebody saying something about life insurance again? Why is somebody saying about something about 401k again? Why is somebody saying about this again? It keeps happening in front of me all the time. You should be paying attention to it. It might be a sign that the good Lord is trying to tell you something. Let me ask you this question. I've asked this question multiple times. I get this from the Bible. How many of the last five or ten decisions have you made, especially right now through the holiday season? How many decisions have you made in the last five, ten decisions you've made have been related to money? And why are they related to money? You know, I always say, if you place a decision in front of you and you extract money from the decision, that exposes then the pure decision you're about to make. For example, I want to buy this for somebody. I want to get this one because I want to give them to his gift, but I don't have the money. That's not the pure decision. If you had your heart and eyes on something, man, I want to give that to a gift as somebody. They need to be blessed with this. I need to give them an opportunity. Guess what? You should give it to them, but you don't do it because you don't have the money. See, that's a problem. And that's a question that you need to find answers to in, in 2021. So therefore, you start removing money from the equation because now you can get to the character of the decision in that process. Last but not least. <laughs> oh, man, you guys might not want to hear this one. And you thought, you thought this was just a warm bath type of biblical conversation. Now, I'm telling you this. I told you at the beginning. I'm not a pastor. I'm a preacher. This is how I interpret the Bible. The, the Bible exposes things that goes on in my life. And it has to be more than me just being a good person. Because in this scripture, in this parable, these servants who took the two talents and five talents, what did they do? Did they, oh, let me go vacation. Let me just go hang out. Let me wait until after the holidays until I start getting to work. You know, you hear that excuse? Yeah, let me just get my New Year's resolution on January 1st. Why not now? Why not immediately? Why do you got to wait for the holidays? Let me, get, let me do it over the weekend. Let me get it done next week. Back to visiting the land of procrastination where dreams go to die. Where blessings and talents that you've been given with go to die because you decide to do it tomorrow. Because these guys, these, these servants, whether it be male or female, they got to work immediately. 
right away. Oh, master, thank you so much. Boom. Okay, let me go make my two towns and two more towns. Awesome. I'm ready for my master to come back. I said, Lord, I, 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 I've been blessed with two towns and take to two towns and I want to bless you right back, sir. Awesome. Five towns. Made five towns. You went to work immediately. You didn't wait for after vacation, after holiday break, next, next week, next month. Hopefully whenever the master gets back a couple days in, in advance before the deadline, do you operate that way? No. They were given a command. What you've been given with the least, you bless, you'll be blessed with with the most because they got to work immediately. Woo! Probably not the message you were looking to hear, but uh, you may not want to be turning into these uh, biblicals, biblical conversations with me on Sunday mornings. But this is how I perceive the Bible. And I, this is serious business to me because this is wisdom that has transcended the test of time that operates in my life and hopefully might operate in your life. And these are the biblical principles and things that I had to see myself for me to say, this is a mirror. This is a reflection of a mirror that was speaking right back to me because I was in operating in these four or five different things. Once I decided to unpack these, this, this parable and these, these points and started to apply them immediately into my life, guess what? My life started to change. It wasn't immediate. It wasn't automatic. It was a process. It wasn't overnight. It took time. Why? Because I needed to shed myself of old habits and start applying myself with new habits because if I want new habits and I want new money, I got to have old habits and old money leave me so I can make new money. I can make room for the true blessing that's come on my way. So I hope the same thing for to you as well. And uh, it's a story about the widow's oil. And so we're going to be referencing a uh, story in 2 Kings chapter 4 on how God is going to use this woman, this widow, and how God can use you in your journey in this crazy era, this time that we're in through the pandemic, post-pandemic, coronavirus, Delta variant, Lambda variant, how God can still use you in a very powerful and mighty way to become the God kind of man and woman and the God kind of millionaire and entrepreneur that he intended and purposed you to be. So let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 4, and let's read the story together. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, well, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars as each is filled, put it to one side. She left them and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Okay, so what are the lessons we can learn from this and how God can use you and why God wants you to become a faith-based millionaire and why God wants you to use you in a powerful way, why God wants you to become an entrepreneur. And I want to preface this by saying, I disclaim, full disclosure, I'm not a pastor, never went to Bible school. Uh, I'm not uh, somebody that went to one of those things, a seminary. I'm just a guy that's in a church reading the Bible and looking to implement it Monday through Saturday so I can be, you know, once I'm fed on Sunday, to implement it on Monday through Saturday in my life, my family, my business, the people I coach and mentor, the people that we employ. I'm looking to incorporate God's Word into all that we do, and that's where this perspective comes from. And so when you're reading the Bible and you are in this relationship you have with God, my assumption, my encouragement to you is don't just let the pastor read the Bible to you on Sundays. Read the Bible Monday through Saturday. Read it with your family. Read it with your team. Read it with your, the people that you influence and coach because we're all on this journey together. And remember, the last time somebody picks up the Bible is when they go to church on Sundays, if they even bring a Bible to church to begin with because today the Bibles are in the church or the scripture is put on the screen. But if you have a personal relationship with God and you're bringing the word, right, you're bringing this Bible and you're heeding to the word and you're learning from the word and it's called a living word because every time you read it, something new happens because you grow as an individual and God blesses you with uh, certain things and puts certain situations in your life and certain things manifest and you read scripture differently than after going through those experiences. So that's just been my experience. So please, before you jump on me, what type of background do you have? What type of knowledge do you have in terms of Bible? Listen guys, I'm just letting you know right now, I'm just a lay person in a church 
just trying to figure out this thing called life and how God wants to use me in his plans, in his, in his world, et cetera, et cetera. So if this helps you, amen. If not, no big deal. There's other videos I'm sure you can watch, but uh, if you want to figure out how the story can help you become an entrepreneur and become a faith-based millionaire, thanks for continuing to watch. So a couple lessons from this story. Um, number one is who do you seek help from? Okay, in times of crisis, this widow went to the man of God, the prophet, Elisha, who God is using in a very mighty and powerful way. See, oftentimes, especially in this world today, about me, 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 social media, you know, selfies and all that type of stuff. Oftentimes, people just want to look at the man and the woman in the mirror and say, that's sufficient for me to get through this issue, this problem, this, this, uh, uh, this situation. Well, in this story here, just to reiterate, she aligned herself with a prophet who was aligned with God, who was active with God and was held accountable to God. And so oftentimes we align ourselves with people who just say, go out and say, I'm just a good person. I'm going to be a good person. Well, how do you know you're a good person? Based on what values and principles that's been anchored over the test of time, in this case, the case of humankind. And that's why for me, I started following the Bible. I haven't been a faith-based believer. I've been a Christian for my entire life. But... Uh, once I started reading the word and I started anchoring myself to values and principles, I realized that I can get through a lot of things out of life because so many winds of life come blowing your way. So many situations come blowing your way. And for me, what has worked out for me, and it may work out for you, is that when you align yourself with God's man and woman that's aligned, active, and accountable, watch what comes your way. Which leads me to say, so sometimes, even my channel, those don't say just because I'm a believer in God that you're going to follow me or listen to anything that I've got to or heed to any of the lessons I'm about to share in this YouTube video. You should go out and seek wisdom from the Bible. You should start processing these things. You should start building that relationship with God. You should start seeing how God is using words and these scriptures to bless you in your life and you start building that connection. You start creating that alignment. You start having your form of activity with God. You start having this accountability with God. Anchor yourself, consider anchoring yourself to scripture and what scripture is sharing with God's people throughout the period of humankind and how it can apply to you even in this year, even in this year of craziness, these years, last couple of years of craziness where everybody in America and then sadly the world is so divided and how God wants to unite and how he wants to use God's man and woman, God's people to be a light in the darkness. So who do you seek help from? Because in this story, her husband incurred a lot of debt. So if there is another lesson to be learned from the beginning of the story is number one, don't get into debt. Avoid owing things to other people. And there's many ways for you to do that by increasing your money knowledge 101. So if you affirm this, put it comment section below. Put in this comment section below this affirmation. I am aligned with God's people. I am aligned with God's people. If you believe that, you're doing that, you're aligned with people who are aligned with God, put it, I am aligned with God's people below in the comment section. Okay, so number two, God wants to use whatever he's already placed in your hand underneath your nose. Because she goes to the prophet and she goes, listen man, I got nothing, I got nothing in the house. I got no gold, got no silver, got no jewelry, got no cash, got no savings, no investments, no 401k. He didn't have a life insurance policy left behind for me, nothing. All I have is a jar of oil. She says, really? Is that you got? You got a jar of oil? Okay, that's the resource God has given you? Okay. Well, let's make the most of what you have. And the interesting thing about this is God is using the least to make the most. Let me repeat that one more time. God will use the least to make the most. So you cannot discount your children. You cannot discount the little blessings you have here and there. You cannot discount the little three, four, five hundred bucks you have in your bank account. God will use the least to make the most. And she says, okay, well, all I got is a jar of oil. So oftentimes we think we got to go to college, we got to get this certification, got that, 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 that. No, God wants to use you right now in this current capacity to make the most of your job, to make the most of your relationships, to make the most of your associations, to make the most of whatever it is you had. Write down, figure out what it is that you have and don't discount it. And oftentimes people discount their blessings. People, oftentimes people discount what they have. I'll give you a quick example. Just yesterday I took my son. I'm a big sports card enthusiast. And we went to the Dallas Card Sports Show yesterday, right here in Allen, Texas, at the big uh, convention center and uh, hotel here. Whole spot, cards, 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 baseball cards, collectibles, souvenirs, you know, sports memorabilia, all over the place, okay? And I go to these tables, and I'm buying cards from uh, these, these folks. And one of the cards that I 
uh, one to collect is this Kevin Durant card. Okay, it's a very rare card because it's the orange. It's not the white one, it's not the black one, it's the orange one. I wanted to collect it. I found out not only did he have it, but he also graded it uh, by this grading company called HGA. So they, authentic they authenticated, they graded it, made sure the corners were squared away, edges, surface, and center. Anyway, make a long story short, I asked him, how did you get this card? And he says, I pulled it when I was 12 years old from a pack. I said, really? And now he's selling me this card years later, and I'm buying it. Uh, from him for like $300. But the cost for him to purchase it back in 2012 was a few bucks. So he turned a few bucks into hundreds of dollars later on. Something as simple as a sports card, something as simple as a baseball card is what God will want to use you. That was this kid's jar of oil. It was sports memorabilia, it was a sports card, trading card. So when you're looking at what God has in store for you, he's already sent it your way. He sent you experiences, he sent you relationships. Now you gotta make the most of it. So if you wanna use this point and incorporate that in your life, put it here in the comment section with this affirmation. I am using what God places in my hands. I am using what God places in my hands. Okay, number three, in the story, she was asked, go ask your neighbors for jars. Go ask your community to assist in your situation. And in God's economy, guess what we're supposed to be able to do in God's economy? You are supposed to help your fellow neighbor Supposed to help the people to left and right. And one thing I love about moving here to Dallas, Texas, is there's so many businesses out here of entrepreneurs. What I love about the, the strip malls, not only will they have their big box chain, you know, Best Buy or Olive Garden or Gap, but they're also going to have about nine, ten other uh, tenants in there that have their own small businesses. Mom and pop restaurants, mom and pop retail stores, mom and pop whatever. But it's all small business owners. And I like to go into those small businesses and do business with the small business because that, in my opinion, is God's economy. I'm helping circulate my dollar into other Christian entrepreneurs, into other small business owners. Because I want my dollar, before it leaves to the these, these big box change restaurants, I want my dollar to circulate amongst other entrepreneurs, other people that have started their own deal. So, back to the story. She was commanded to go get jars. Go get more jars. Get, get more jars from your neighbors. Collect. Hey, can I borrow your jar? Hey, can I borrow your jar? Hey, can I borrow? Knock, knock, knock. Can I borrow your jar? Knock, knock, knock. Can I borrow your jar? The boldness to talk to people, her neighbors, who probably she had not had a relationship with before this crisis, before her husband passed away. Now she's asking for jars, which also is to lead you to believe that you should be neighborly. You should get to know the people that you are living around, or you should choose your neighbors wisely, or you should live in a neighborhood where you can depend on your neighbors. That you are a community of people that was looking out for each other, and they're easy for you to access if you need to borrow a jar, so something as simple as that. So she was commanded to go out, and even in scripture it says, don't ask for just a few. Hmm, was that like a preface to a blessing? Don't ask for just a few, it says in scripture. So if you go out and help with your neighbors, and you're involved in your community, don't ask for a few, don't ask for one or two people. Don't ask for one or two jars, ask in abundance. And I wonder if that's what this widow did, but she was commanded to not ask for just a few. Number four, she was commanded to go with her sons, close the door, let's get to work. And so she says, what are you talking about? I got, I, got this jar, I got this jar of oil, okay? I got this jar of oil. Hey sons, boys, come here real quick. I got this jar of oil and start pouring? And start pouring? Wait, wait a minute, it's, it's you know, one container of oil. But God is now about to create the miracle here, you see? <laughs> He's about to create a miracle. She kept pouring, and it filled up. Wait, wait a minute, get an, let me get another one. Boom, it filled up, whoa, whoa, whoa. give me, get another, this oil is not stopping. Yo, it's not, st Look, boys, get some more jars, get some more jars, get some more jars. She kept pouring, this oil was not stopping. Therein lies the miracle. God is creating something abundant in her life. And she's like, oh, give me another one. And then, next thing you know, boom. Mom, we don't have any more jars. <laughs> and as soon as the boy said that, and she had nothing else to pour the oil into, then that's when the oil stopped pouring. You know what I'm thinking at this time? About how this would have felt? Dang. I wish I had more jars. I now know why the prophet said, don't ask for just a few. Because a miracle is about to come your way. You <laughs> see, that's what the reality is. Hey, you go about doing your business, your career, your interviews, 
uh, selling your product, your service, door to door, selling your product at the mall, the retail stores, online, whatever, don't ask for just a few because God's about to do a mighty work with your actions because you're trusting him to bring resources, clients, customers, website traffic, people in abundance to your conference, your event, your way. If you are just not asking for a few and you're just not saying, yo, okay, God, let me ask you for limitations because you're asking God for limitations. You're expecting limitations, but yet you serve a guy that has unlimitations, not limits in his realm. So here, pour with your family, work together with your family, work together with your boys. One of the things I love doing with the children is they were babies, now they're grown. I got kids that are ranging from 25. Actually, today's uh, JoJo's birthday. He's turning 11 today. And tomorrow, my oldest son turns 26. So we've got children in our household, and we want to involve our kids and our business in what we're doing. They may not completely understand it now at the stage of life that they're in, but they're going to be exposed to it. So God wants to expose your children to his miracles with you taking action. And if you take an action... The next thing here is, number five, the prophet then said, okay, now that you got your jars filled with oil, go sell it. Go sell it back to your neighbors. Go sell it to the marketplace. Go sell it at the flea market. Go sell it at the mall. Go sell it online. She was commanded to go sell it. And some of you guys are saying, well, listen, didn't God just bless her with resources, put the blessing on her lap by pouring oil into all these jars? Yes, but God ain't just going to send you money. You got to go out and sell it. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 26. Even King Solomon, the wisest and richest king who ever lived, even King Solomon puts in his Proverbs this instruction. Let's read it together. It reads like this. People curse the man who hoards grain, but blessing crowns him who is willing to sell. <laughs> so in other words, God's got ama amazing resources that you have, that he's given you, that he's gifted you. But you are cursed because you're not selling it. You've got a way to communicate with people. You've got a way to interact with people. Well, Matt, you don't understand. I'm an introvert. Yeah, but God still wants you to sell. God still wants you to communicate. God still wants you to connect. You might be introverted in your own personal type, but right now God's got a mission for you because God didn't create for you to be in a cave. God created you to be a blessing, to be in your community, amongst your neighbors, to interact. Now, whether it's four hours a day, eight hours a day, 20 hours, it's up to how you feel that God is leading you in, in that regard, but God wants you to go out and sell things. God has allowed you to get through college. God has allowed you to get through the situation. God has allowed you to get through the scenario. Now, go out and sell it. Go out and market it. Get say, hey, you got a problem? You got a problem? You don't have oil? Here's a jar. Want to buy? And that's what she and her sons did. So this widowed woman is teaching her sons, who's watching, observing this whole thing, to trust God and the pouring of this oil to see a miracle happening in their life. And then they're watching mom follow the prophet's instruction, following God's instruction, to go out into the marketplace. And I'm sure, I'm sure when you're selling things, guess what she ran across? Nah, I don't need the oil. Ah, I'm good. I got enough. I'm pretty sure in that journey of selling oil, it wasn't just go, go pour the jar of oil and go sell the jar. It wasn't that easy. It's never that easy. And I don't want you to go about thinking that it's that easy. But I'm pretty sure along the way of her going out to go sell it, she faced a lot of no's. She faced a lot of nah. When she started collecting money, I'm pretty sure that some people wanted to rob her of her cash because she started carrying around an abundance of cash from selling her jars of oil. So she needed protection, to discreetly hold her finances, hold her money aside and, and, and not get robbed. I'm sure that scenario happened too as well. But you're looking at the scripture is that God is putting something in your life in a very supernatural basis. What I love about being an entrepreneur it allows me to tap into my faith every stinking day. The last, okay, the recording of this video is 2021. The last time I took a paycheck from somebody else to make a living to pay my bills was 2003, 17, 18 years ago. And the biggest worry for me was to say, oh my gosh, I don't have a guaranteed paycheck. I don't have a guaranteed income. I don't have the military uh, paycheck on the 1st and the 15th. No, 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 no. <laughs> I slipped into a new economy. The economy of trust, trusting God. I was going to go about, I said, I acquired a skill, got to put $500 in my way so I can get an insurance license to go out there and market myself in the community, find people that need insurance, people that need retirement planning. I was able to make a living off that, earning fees and commissions because I was able to trust God in my decision, to trust God in my journey. I'm saying, you know what, God, I'm a single dad. I got three kids. 
what normal job can I get? What normal job can I get that I can drop off my kids at 8.30, pick them up at 3.30, that I don't have to clock and clock on and get fired? And God placed in my way. I wish I could say I chose the insurance industry, but God said, no, 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 I'm going to direct you to the insurance industry, and God's going to direct you to the industry he feels you are best fit for the talents and gifts he's given you to go about and doing his work. And so from a supernatural standpoint, trusting God in faith, Lord, where do I find the customers? Well, you got to go out and pour. You got to be ready and available. You got to have something to sell. And when you have something to sell, go out and sell it. Sometimes I face many people, oh, my house got to change. I want God to change my life. How's he going to do it? Listen, listen, you got all these things right now. You got to go out and sell it. Market yourself. Oh, you know that one or two people. Yeah, this, you talk about 100 and 200 people. No, no, one or two people. No, 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 that's not, that's not sales. That's not reality. There's another parable I talked about in terms of the parable of the sower. Watch this video here about how you should be acting as a sower of your goods and services, as seed. And when you look at yourself in a scenario, you have to understand that God is a God of abundance. God is a God of unlimited resource. God is a God of unlimited provisions. So when you're looking at your relationship with God that way, if I serve an unlimited God, if I serve a God with unlimited resources, I would serve a God with unlimited provisions, why am I limiting myself to just 25 phone calls? Why am I limiting myself to just seeing 10 people today? Why am I limiting myself to just this, this one campaign? So with that being said, to answer the prevailing question at the beginning of the video is, why God wants you to become an entrepreneur? You know why? Because he wants you to depend on him. He wants you to lean on him. One of the commandments, God says, I am a jealous God. I want you to worship and honor only me. And in exchange of you worshiping and honoring me, guess what's going to happen to you in your life? Well, you know, it's, you know, God can't tell me what to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you what you want to follow. If you want to be egotistical and arrogant and all that stuff, knock yourself out. God has given you this thing called free will. But if you're wondering why things are a mess in your life, ask yourself that question. Why are things are a mess in my life? Is my ego, my pride in my way? Have I not shifted my identity away from just me, myself, and I? Or can I shift my identity to serve, to help others, to be an example that God can use in a very button way, that you can be the light in the darkness? Ask yourself, and God, how can I be used? Well, use what you got, man. This jar of oil. <laughs> this jar of oil you can use. Really, that, that, that's what you want me to use, God? Nothing sophisticated? No, that's it. I want you to use a jar. And then pour. And then collect and then sell. So let's jump right into this parable of the sower here in Matthew 13. He's talking about a farmer. He's talking about a sower. He's out there sowing his seed. So let's read the scripture together here. Matthew 13. And let's just jump right here into verse 3. It says, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell amongst the thorns, which grew up, but later choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So what Jesus is saying is, Man, go out there and sow your seed. Money is nothing more than a seed. You're making money, you have to be able to sow it back into the ground. In other words, you reinvest it, okay? So let's talk about this real quick. Number one, let's break this down. Your job, you may not be called a farmer. You may be called an entrepreneur. You may be called an engineer. You might be called you know, an athlete. You might be called a, a gymnast. You might be called a, a singer, an entertainer. Whatever it is, you have a job and that job pays you money, that money is seed. You have a responsibility with that seed. Your money is to sow that seed back. It's not to hoard it. You know, later on in the scripture, he talks about the deceitfulness of wealth and greed when it kicks in. But your job with money is to sow it. And a lot of times people say, I'm not sure exactly what I need to do with money. Well, you have a big reason to make a lot of money. Listen, Deuteronomy 8.18 in the Bible, that God is giving you the power to create wealth. He's not going to force you to do it. you got to want to be able to do it. But I think it's one of the interesting things about God. It's one of the interesting things about our higher power is that <laughs> he gave us free will. He said many things that we need to listen to, but he's not going to force us to do it. I mean, I learned long ago that I'm not God. I ain't trying to be God. I'm trying to change anybody's mind. 
that God job is already taken. And even if I was God, guess what? I still can't change people's minds. What's evidence of that? Well, the story about Adam and Eve, the first human beings ever created. Adam, he said to Adam and Eve, do not eat the apple. You could have an entire garden of Eden. You could have everything here. The sun even had to listen to your body temperature. That if it was too hot, the sun had to back off. The animals were named by you. The, the birds, the fish, everything had to bow down to Adam and Eve walking around in his garden of Eden. And think about the conversation there that God had with them. Do not eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. Do not eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. And guess what they did? They ate the fruit. Of all the things they could have not had, they chose that one thing they couldn't eat. And they did it. Well, here's the thing. They weren't clear. They weren't clear in their responsibility. They weren't clear in what they were here to do. And you are operating as an entrepreneur. You have a job. You have a family. You have children. Your job is to have a responsibility of making money to sow that into people's lives. The people that you love and care about. Here's my question. Lots of times people don't make money. You know why? Because they're not clear about what they want to do. You know, there's a movie out there by George Clooney. It's called Up in the Air. And he was laying off people. That was his job. He was a consultant, HR. He's field training somebody next to him. And he's laying people off left and right. And he's teaching this young lady how to lay people off with grace, apparently. Anyway, one of the guys, he's laying off. He's laying them off. And one of the questions he asks him, how much did they first pay you to give up on your dreams? 27 grand a year. And when were you going to stop and come back and do what makes you happy? So a job kept him from pursuing his dream. So he wasn't clear on what he wanted to do. And I hope here in the beginning of 2021, you are clear about what God has placed in your heart, in your spirit, put into your path, what he wants you to do. As I look back on my life, I look at many different things that happened. And guess what? For a large part of my life, I was not listening. I wasn't listening. I was doing this. I was doing this. I was doing this. I spent my 30s repaying back the mistakes of my 20s because I wasn't listening. So I hope that you're listening to this video. And you're watching this video right now. And maybe God has it on your heart. Maybe you should pay attention to the conversation, the message of this video, that you have a job to do. You have a responsibility. And in context here of this, of this parable is to sow seeds. You got to make money. In other words, a farmer doesn't have seeds. He had to acquire the seeds. In other words, he had to buy it. He had to earn it. And now he earned it. He got it. Now his job is to go out there and sow his seed. Number two, along his path of sowing the seed, he faced different types of ground. He faced potential distractions. What am I talking about? First of all, the first area that this parable talks about, he planted his seed on the path along the way. And it really didn't set. It didn't really get in the soil. It potentially is a hardened path. And along the journey, along the way, the seed never took. And guess who took the seed though? The birds. So the sower's job, he's planting the seeds, planting the seeds, planting the seeds. Oops, they're wrong ground, wrong ground. Anyway, he kept sowing. And the birds ate it up. Now here's what the sower didn't do. He didn't stop and say, hey, give me back my seed. Hey, give me back my seed. He wasn't chasing the birds. He wasn't chasing the distractions. Let me translate that to some fair form of practicality. Sometimes you get involved in a business and along the way, you stumble across the wrong website. You stumble across the wrong negative person. You stumble across somebody who's been there, done that, gives you all the advice, but never been there, done that. But along the path, the birds ate you up. You make a commitment. You say, I'm going to be there. I'm going to make a phone call. I'm going to show up for an appointment. And guess what? You run across the birds and you don't get there. Or you hire somebody. You recruit somebody. You train somebody. You get a customer. And along the way, they change their mind. They ask for the money back. But guess what your job is to do? Keep sowing your seeds. That is going to happen. The biggest part about many people is they try to change things. Remember in the beginning I said this conversation, I am not God. And I'm not here to change things. That job is already taken. Your job is a human being. I hope that you take this with grace. It's not to change anybody. The only person you got to worry about changing and improving is you. And you hope that other people are influenced by your change and your seeds and your fruits of your labor that's inspiring other people. The second part, the second ground that faced along the way is the rocky ground. Here's the rocky ground. Uh, it took, it went through. And it started coming up, and it was scorched by the soil. Why? Because it didn't have any deep roots. 
So when people aren't clear about what they want out of life, sure, I'm excited. The emotion got me. I'm so fired up to do this. I make an emotional commitment. Yes, I'm going to change my life. Yes, I got this. I got that. I'm going to do this with my New Year's resolution. Finally, for one time in my life, I got a break. But the roots didn't go deep. The, the, the belief, the understanding, the understanding that you have to cultivate it. You have to deepen your skill. You have to, it's, you have to spread your wisdom and understanding. And you say, oh, how come I'm not getting rich in 30 days? How come this isn't panning out in six months? How come this is panning out after a couple years of doing it? It's called the shallow ground. And the moment those distractions keep putting their pressure on, and they will, guess what? You get scorched. Done. You're gone. You got burnt. Third thing, the seed, the tip of the top of the ground, started taking, awesome. Then it started growing. And then it started growing. It started growing. Next thing you know, what grew with it? The thorns. The thorns say, I, I see you, you're coming up. I see you, you're coming up. Oh, we can't let you come up. We can't let you outshine us. We got to give you some shade. We got to choke you out. We got to make sure you don't grow anymore. That's like a lot of people in your life, a lot of situations in your life, they see you on the rise. They see your progress. They see you growing. They see your investments start paying off. Your money starts to grow. This distraction, you want to buy this, you want to buy that. Those are the thorns that steal your seed. Or worse, the seed starts growing and it kills it before it even has a chance to grow. It's about to get a breakthrough. It's about to bust through to the next level. And what did you do? You quit. Person watching this, you quit. Because that seed was planted along the thorns. So as you're managing your money, you're earning your income. Yes, there's things along the way that keep you from actually manifesting and growing. Guess what? That's part of the path. That's part of the journey. See, when, when you're thinking about your finances, you think that everything has to be perfect. I can't tell you one entrepreneur I've ever run into that 100% of the way, every financial decision they made has been panning out the way they thought it would pan out. Along the way, the seed of their money, their finances, yes, it gets choked up. Yes, the birds swoop it up. Yes, you find people that lie, cheat, and steal from you. Yes, along the way, you get wiser and smarter. Yes, you learn how to protect your money. You learn how to protect your seed life better. And then you run some D. Then you start planting seed on the good ground. And here's about the good ground. It starts setting. It starts growing. It starts creating in size. And guess what happens? It returns 60 times, 100 times, 30 times. That's according to Scripture. Wait, wait a minute. So the good ground returns 30, 60, 100 times. And those certain things pan out differently. The good ground doesn't mean it's all the same. Some people come into your life for a season. Awesome. They've done a job for you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you being here. Some investments come and give you a, a 5% return. Some give you a 30% return. Hey, thanks. It didn't pan out anymore. Let me replant my seed. Let me continue sowing. Money's supposed to be sown, harvested, re-sown, harvested, on and on. It just shouldn't be hoarded. We look at money and we get back to how would Jesus deal with 600 bucks, 1200 bucks? How do we deal with the stimulus check? How do we deal with the business revenue from a, a company and your career? It's to keep that money replanted and growing. It's to keep that money cycling. Your job is to sow. You're trying to grow a business. People lie to you. People uh, doubt you. Uh, people say, I'll be there. They don't show up. Uh, I'll be a customer. Then ask for the money back. Hey, handle that with grace. That's part of the journey of your job as a sower. Keep going. Until you eventually find a good ground. You know, oftentimes my wife and I, we qualify for uh, these trips, company paid trips. They take us to places all over the world. They take us on world travel. They take us to, to Dubai, to Costa Rica. And guess what we talk about on these trips? Not only do we talk about getting better, but guess what we talk about? Babe, aren't we glad that we, we, we push through the rocky ground? Aren't we glad we pushed past the people that stabbed us in the back and lied on us and, and we forgave them and went with grace and said we continue to make success our greatest revenge? Because we're not thinking about that stuff right now. We're glad that we became better people. We're glad that our money was reinvested to creating jobs. Because that's where we're at today. Because we're making, we're creating, we're growing, and it's part of the good ground. Because the good ground, the 100 times return, the 60 times return, the 30 times return, will then outshadow and outshine the rocky ground. It outshine the path along the way. It outshine the crows because you're going to start soaring like an eagle. And guess what happens when you're an eagle? You fly at an altitude that the crows and the ravens cannot breathe at. And that's all they do. Cock, 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 cock. They can't, all they're doing is screaming at you, but they can't soar up here like you are. 
Last but not least, when we're talking about the parables again, you know, this parable wraps up with Jesus saying some things here, and it's really left to interpretation. He says here, this is why I speak to people in parables. They see, although they do not see. Through hearing, they do not hear or understand. What? I'm, try I'm trying to pack that down. And he continues here. Now it gets a little bit more clear. You'll ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. And anytime you deal with money, money has a way to callous one's heart, to create some deceit, because people think there's some form of power behind it, and there is, but not for the right purpose. And when I'm talking about God wants you to be rich, and why God wants you to be wealthy and prosperous and happy, it's not because of the negative things that go along with it. He's already talking about it, but he knows that by you creating a seed, you can elevate yourself, you can manifest the good part about this conversation, and show how good God's grace can be in, one, in one's life. And I'll wrap up here in verse 23. He says, But the one who received the seed that fell into good soil is a man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, six, or thirty times what was sown. And what do you think that sower will do the next season? Hoard it, just put it up in a storehouse and forget about it? A good farmer, a good sower, will sell the crop, the harvest, to the marketplace and retain some to be reinvested back into the springtime to repeat the cycle all over again. So as I wrap stuff up, I want to know what your thoughts are. How are you dealing with your money? How are you handling your finances? Here's one thing I do know. When I was living paycheck to paycheck, one of the worst times of my life, I couldn't have any seed. Guess what my seed was doing? My seed paycheck to paycheck was stuck on the path along the way. My seed was stuck in the rocky ground. It was stuck in shell being scorched by bills, getting scorched by uh, bad decisions. It was getting choked up by thorns, by negative people trying to take money from me. But I hope in this year, 2021, you're able to reflect upon the scripture and say, listen, my job, I should be released to say, I need to go out there and make a lot of money. Because I know what the benefit is, especially in America, where the goodness of people here saying, you know what, I've got a lot of people out there that's taking this money and not doing the best by it. They're just hoarding it and spending it and not really replanting it and not really reinvesting it. This is an opportunity for you, if you believe in God's people, to say, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to elevate this message. I'm going to scream it from the mountaintops because I have the financial resources to do so when you follow the parable of the seller. So consider the story here in 2021 about what you're going to do and how this could be the financial breakthrough. In the last year, you worry about money for the rest of your life. And you worried about fulfilling the purpose that you feel has been placed in your heart and your spirit.